On the phone, we have a player I remember playing for the San Diego Chargers back in the day, one of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history, Pro Football Hall of Famer Dan Fouts. How are you doing today, Dan? Good, good, David. Good to be with you. I see that uh, you were born in San Francisco, California. How did you end up going to Oregon for college? Well, it's the only major uh, football program that offered me a scholarship, so um, that was that was the deal right there. When you played in high school, were you more of a, a passing quarterback, or were you more the traditional quarterback back then and just handed the ball off to the running backs? Well, we had a very good football team. Uh, we had 11 guys get uh, college scholarships off of our, our championship team of 1967. So there was a lot of attention uh, given to our team. We won the uh, city title, and uh, uh, we had great running attack with uh, a couple of running backs that went down to USC. So uh, my job basically was to hand the ball off a lot and uh, uh, throw it occasionally. And uh, one game where I threw it a lot uh, and had some success was when the Oregon coaches were in attendance uh, watched the game. And uh, two of those coaches, one was named George Seeds, the other was named uh, John Robinson. And uh, Seifert recruited me because he was a San Francisco guy, and uh, John Robinson uh, was from the Bay Area as well. What were those guys like as coaches? Well, they're outstanding uh, men, first of all, and I think that that goes a long way. Our head coach, Jerry Fry, uh, really put together a great staff. uh, And, um, you know, the the big thing was that we were underdogs a lot because uh, at the time there were, no limit on scholarships, and, and uh, it was it was difficult with those in those days to to compete with the big schools. But uh, uh, we we uh, we competed as well as we could. Because back then, Oregon wasn't thought of as a football school like it is today. No, it wasn't, and uh, uh, you got to give credit to you know Rich Brooks for turning the program around, getting it headed in the right direction, and Mike Pilati. Uh, I think the hallmark of of the Oregon program uh, for the last 25, 30 years has been stability in the coaching staffs. And, and uh, you know, Chip Kelly is there. He does a great job. He leaves, but instead of hiring somebody from the outside, they keep the tradition of hiring from the inside and, and bring in Mark Helfrich. And uh, he was 10-2 and two his first year. Mike Cole said, I've got to mention the game because he went to Missouri when you played Missouri. Do you remember that game? Yeah, we had a bad call in <laughs> the game. Uh, they called, uh, we had a screen pass go for a long touchdown, and they said that we had a man downfield. And looking at the tapes, you know, all these years later, uh, we just still didn't have that man down the field. So a little home cooking there in Columbia. Yeah. So you kept the tapes. Just remind yourself how you got kind of jobbed in that game. No, I didn't need to keep them. They're in my mind with all the other close uh, controversial plays that uh, happened in my career. <laughs> Did you know that the Chargers were looking at you when you got drafted in 73? No, I hadn't really heard a word from them. Uh, I hadn't really heard a word from any team. Uh, in those days, it was a lot different. There wasn't the combines. There wasn't the 24-7 uh, NFL news. and uh, There weren't a lot of teams going around working guys out. And uh, so uh, when I was drafted by the Chargers, I was completely surprised. What was that first training camp like? It was great because um, a guy named Johnny Unitas was there, and, and I got to learn a lot from him. And, and uh, in the short time that uh, I was on the team with him, uh, you know, he was just such a great guy. Uh, I don't know why he took a liking to me, but he did. And, and we hung out a little bit and had a couple of cold beers after practice. And, you know, for a 22-year-old kid, uh, all of a sudden looking across the locker room, and there's Johnny Unitas. It was pretty awesome. Raymond Berry mentioned to me that him and United just used to practice throwing back and forth, and that's how they developed their timing. And then they brought Lenny Moore into the fold, and he did the same thing. They made him a great running back and receiver. Did Johnny teach you that uh, little practice technique? Well, that's that's pretty much uh, you know what what you got to do. I mean, nobody had to really uh, tell anybody that that's the the secret to success. But I think that. With United and Barry, it was uh, it was like a science. They were they were so good, and uh, they played together for so long. I eventually developed that type of rapport with Charlie Joyner, and then with Kellen Winslow and John Jefferson and Wes Chandler. Where, you know, if you want to be good on Sundays, you better be good on the other six days of the week. What was it like when Don Coriel took over? 
Well, when football came, uh, you know, our team was in disarray. Uh, we we had some pretty good talent on the team, but we just couldn't seem to get it together. And, uh, Coriel really basically just relaxed a little bit and, and gave it some good plays and uh, put in his system eventually. And, and uh, you know, the rest is history. I mean, with with the talent like uh, John Jefferson and uh, Kellen Winslow and Charlie Joyner, uh, you know, that, that's uh, three outstanding individuals there, all, all all pros. And our offensive line came together when we traded for Ed White from Minnesota and really helped the pass protection, and, and that helped me out, obviously. How enjoyable was it being part of that offense? It's hard to describe because uh, we would have such a good day on Wednesday when we put the game plan in that we couldn't wait to get to Sunday because we knew we were going to be successful against uh, certain teams and against certain defensive schemes. Uh, Coriel was just ahead of his time with uh, his, his plan and, and the way that uh, he, he coached us. Uh, it was up-tempo. You know, you hear that a lot now uh, about teams and how they practice, but uh, we practiced as fast as we played, and, and I think that really helped. <clears throat> how did you know, or how, how were you able to distribute the ball so well? I mean, usually when you get that many stars in a team, it's hard because Again, they don't want to share the spotlight. They want the ball all the time. How hard was it? It, it wasn't really hard because it was a system, and uh, it was based upon uh, you know timing and, and flooding zones and, and uh, looking for uh, the two on one, and then eventually the one on none. Uh, it, it really, the receivers all knew that uh, that I was just reading the defense, and they were reading at the same time, and. Uh, pretty much every time, uh, if we were on the same page, uh, the defense would dictate to us where the ball would go. So it really wasn't a matter of, of ego or playing favorites. It just uh, it was really uh, very mature on on the part of our receivers, knowing that uh, you know the defense is not playing favorites here. The defense is telling them where to throw the ball. What cornerback gave you the hardest time? Pardon me. Well, who was the toughest cornerback that you basically had to go against? Oh, uh, well, you know, there were so many good ones uh, in that era. Uh, you know, Mike Haynes of the Raiders was great. Louis Wright of the Broncos. Uh, it seemed like everybody on, uh, in at least the AFC West, had one guy that that you tried to stay away from as much as possible. Uh, when I broke into the league, Willie Brown of the Raiders, the Hall of Famer. Uh, he used to pick me off once a game until I got smart and quit throwing the ball in his direction. So, uh, you know, the, the, the great ones, uh, you know, you can just look at the Hall of Fame and, and during that era, and those were the guys that we had to face. The quarterback position has changed now. Now everybody wants these mobile quarterbacks. Back when you played, it was basically stay back in the pocket and get rid of the ball quickly. Do you miss those kind of uh, way of play a quarterback? Well, I still think they're there. I mean, if you look at Tom Brady and you look at Drew Brees and, and you look at uh, uh, Peyton Manning, uh, those are three of the top quarterbacks in the league, and they're not running around anywhere. They're, they know where their protection is. So, you know, you've, you've got the influx of some younger guys uh, that are, are mobile and that can get away from, from just about anything. But the, the passing game is still designed to have a pocket and to throw from the pocket. Now, if you can do that and then do things outside the pocket, like a Russell Wilson, uh, then you've got a Super Bowl champ. But, uh, you know, sooner or later, uh, those defenders are going to get you, no matter how mobile you might be. And, and uh, the safest place still is in that pocket. And you had a great line blocking for you, which kind of helped. Oh, yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, Billy Shields is my left tackle, Doug Wilkson, my left guard, Donnie Masick, my center, Ed White, the right guard and Big Russ Washington, our right tackle. and uh, They should get a lot more credit for the things that uh, Air Coriel uh, put put on the scoreboard and and the record books, but uh, they're all selfless men and uh, great teammates. What made Coriel such a great coach? Well, you know, I I get asked that a lot, and I I think it just is adaptability, is steadfastness about uh, what is the right way of going about things, and uh, the firm belief that you can win games throwing the ball and, and to be fearless doing it. Uh, the the uh, commitment that he has to his system, and uh, it, it just uh, permeated throughout the team and, and gave us all the feeling that we were going to be successful. And, 
And that's what any great coach will do is, you know, make sure that his team has confidence that they can go out and win every Sunday. One of your offensive coordinators was Bill Walsh. Did you realize the genius in Bill Walsh? Well, I certainly missed him when he went away. Uh, he was there with me in 1976, and up to that point, uh, I, I really never had a, uh, an offensive coordinator or a quarterback coach, certainly nobody with his caliber. Uh, uh, he and I had a great rapport. He left after that year because the Chargers decided not to hire him as their head coach, so he went up to Stanford and turned that program around, So, uh, and, of course, the 49ers. So, uh, you know, Walsh uh, meant a lot to my career. He he rebuilt uh, my, my game from the ground up as far as footwork and reading defenses and things like that. And then, uh, you know, it all came together two years later when Corey Hill came to San Diego. With the great receivers you had, you had Hall of Famers Charlie Joyner, Cullen Winslow. Was there one that was your go-to guy? And, no, it, it just depended on the situation. They, they were all dependable. They were all uh, very tough, uh, fearless over the middle, uh, and, and enjoyed playing the game. I mean, we had we had a good time in practice uh, because, uh, uh, you know, you throw the ball around, uh, guys are making catches. Uh, uh, it's it's not drudgery. It, it's uh, upbeat. And, and that's the way we played on Sundays. And, and so... Uh, you know, I, I described the four top receivers I had and all in different ways. I mean, uh, Joyner was just, uh, I, I just knew where he was going to go every time he ran down the field and, and was so reliable. Uh, Kellen was, uh, he set the standard for tight ends uh, because of his versatility and toughness. Uh, JJ could make the, just the most spectacular catches in a crowd or by himself with one hand. Then Wes Chandler was a guy that could run through an entire defense if you got him the ball in the right place. So I was just the luckiest guy in the world to have four receivers like that. Everybody talked about the Super Bowl this year. They were concerned about the weather, and they kept bringing up that playoff game that you guys had with the Bengals in Cincinnati. How bad was the weather conditions that day? Well, it was windy, <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that was uh, the biggest problem for me. Uh, the cold, obviously, uh, uh, whatever the windshield said it was, but uh, well, the Bengals played better than we did that day, and, and uh, they, they uh, handled the weather better, and they deserved to win. Uh, it would, it was, uh, we had a rematch with them the following year in San Diego, and uh, had quite a shootout with with them and that we won. Uh, but that day they were better than us, and, and you got to give them that credit. Did you have a favorite game in your career? Well, um, you know, I, I usually answer that by saying, you know, any time we scored more than 40 was one of my favorites. And so, you know, we, we did that often. And that, uh, you know, there's a couple of games that stand out, the Miami playoff game. Uh, the last time we played the Raiders in Oakland before they moved to, to uh, Los Angeles, we put 55 on them in the Coliseum. And uh, one of my favorites was against the Forty nine, forty one, thirty seven. For me, that was special because it was the only time I played a regular season game in my hometown. <clears throat> was there a defense that gave you more trouble than any other? Um, no, I, I think uh, you know teams with with great players, uh, you know, always gave us problems. And you know, playing against the Raiders was always an adventure and. Uh, you know, I guess I kind of lean to city and, and Oakland twice a year. And uh, once you have that familiarity, it, it's it's uh, it's difficult to to come up with new ways to to beat them. But uh, they they were great at times. Uh, you know, the Steelers obviously were uh, in their heyday were were awesome because of the great players they had. How did you know when it was time to retire? Well, uh, my body told me, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the best way of knowing uh, when you can't, uh, uh you gotta be honest with yourself and, and you don't want to embarrass yourself. And, uh, I knew that after 15 years, I'd had enough and, and that, uh, I was anxious to get on with my uh, second career. How did it feel when you found out that you were going into the hall of fame? How did I find out? 
you know, how did you feel when you found out you're going in? Well, obviously, uh, just absolutely thrilled. Uh, I was with my family and, uh, uh, we were sitting around to wait for that phone to ring if it was going to ring at all. And so when it did ring and, and, uh, they said that congratulations, um, you know, the, the emotions that you feel, uh, the gratitude, uh, of all the people that helped you get where you got and, uh, the support from your family and friends, uh, it's overwhelming. And it's the most humbling uh, experience even to this day, 20 years later, uh, to realize that you are in the Hall of Fame with, with the greats that have ever played the game. It's, uh, it, it's an awesome feeling. People in the Hall of Fame all say it's the greatest collection of people around because it's a team that you're a part of till the day you die and you can't be cut off that team. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, a famous quote from Deacon Jones, and uh, he said, uh, just as, as you mentioned, that uh, now you are on the best team of all time, and uh, you can never leave that team. <sighs> and they said it's it's an honor. You don't, no one deserves to be there, but it's an honor to be there. No one basically has a right to be there. It's an honor. And they hate when players say that I earned it. No, it's an honor. You know, there's no question about it, and uh, uh, it's it's fun to go back and and uh, reminisce with guys every year and and talk about uh, how great we used to be, even if we weren't that great. Was there a player you modeled yourself after growing up? No, not really. I was just trying to trying to play ball and have fun doing it. What made you get into broadcasting? Well, my dad was a longtime voice of the San Francisco 49ers when I was growing up, and I uh, spent a lot of time uh, in the broadcast booth with him, either keeping stats or uh, spotting for him. So, uh, you know, as a kid, uh, it looked like a, a really cool way of, of uh, making a living. And fortunately, when I uh, retired from the Chargers, I, I got an audition with CBS and, and uh, worked out well. So... It's been 26 or 7 years now, going on my 27th year, and uh, it's, it's my great jobs of all time. Your dad calling games when they had the million-dollar backfield? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the million-dollar backfield of White Tittle, John Henry Johnson, Hugh McElhaney, and Joe Perry. And uh, all of them are in the Hall of Fame. That was incredible. Talking to White Tittle, he said the biggest problem was knowing who to throw the ball to because they all wanted the ball. Yeah. That's a common that's a common uh, occurrence in the NFL when you have that great players. Uh, you want those players to want the ball every t- every time. He goes, it was hard for me to shine because again, with the three running backs there, again they all wanted it, and it's tough. And he goes, and I had a great receiver in Owens. Yes, he did, and and uh, he also had Billy Wilson as well. So uh, the Forty ers always it seems like in those days were always uh, great on the offensive side of the ball. Wasn't the other broadcaster Lon Simmons, or am I thinking of someone else? No, uh, Lon Simmons did a lot of the 49 games uh, with my dad and then after my dad. Uh, my dad's primary uh, uh, analyst was Gordy Soltau, who also played with Tittle. 